Let me just. Oh, okay, fine. Sure. No worries. Another port? Yes, I do. Ah. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank God for Kevin. Maybe. It'll be fine. <laughs> this one's we'll finicky see. sometimes, so don't say it too quickly. <laughs> So I've come, I've come down to this. But it's, it's more yeah. for... Um, what about you? Um, I'm over. Do you want to come for Jay? Oh, yeah. Oh, sweet. Oh. Yes! Oh. <laughs> oh, Yay! Thank you, Kevin. You're the, you're the best. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> well, sorry. All right. testing all of my coordination skills to hold a mic and a clicker at the same time. <laughs> it's like, you know, what is it, rubbing your belly and patting your head at the same time? Yeah, exactly. This is... <laughs> right. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Woo! Nobody got lost in the fog? It was, it was really foggy coming down from Evergreen. Um, well, cool. So I think there might still be some more people trickling in, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, the talk that we're doing here is um, Economic Engines, Mobilizing Startup and Angel Investing Ecosystems. Um, and before we kick off, I just want to thank our sponsors. Um, so thank you to the title sponsors of Denver Startup Week, Amazon, Capital One Cafe, Dell for Startups, and Downtown Denver Partnerships. And specifically, this session is um, part of the Spotlight Track, which is sponsored by Southwest and Chase. So big thanks to them for um, allowing us to do this little talk. Um, yeah, and if you want to post about this, make sure to do hashtag Den Startup Week. Um, and then specifically, we're from Rocky's Venture Club, so you can uh, talk about us in the socials. Oh, and I have a clicker, so I don't need to do the thing on my computer. <laughs> All right, so you're probably wondering who are these lovely people here in the front of the room talking to you? Um, so I'm Elena Von Phillips. I'll be moderating this panel this morning. Um, and I come to you from Rocky's Venture Club where I lead investment deal flow and due diligence. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about Rocky's Venture Club here in a second. Um, before <laughs> uh, joining this side of the table, I was an entrepreneur myself. Um, I was a co-founder in two clean tech startups, one of which was named top five most promising startups in the world, nominated for a TED Award. And I can say that I got to pitch Damon John one-on-one -on -one in the lobby of a Miami hotel and got him to want to invest in our company in a 60 second pitch. So, hey. <laughs> and we turned him down. <laughs> he wanted to do a licensing deal. Um, and that would have been the smart move at the time. But anyways, story for another day. <laughs> um, and then I'd just like to pass it over to our lovely panelists here. So we've got Jake Rashavi, David Back, and Abby Pickle, who are each going to introduce themselves um, right now. So I'm gonna pass it to Jake. Great. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jake Rashavi. Uh, I am currently the executive director of Chafee County Economic Development Corporation in Salida, Colorado. If anybody knows it, a uh, pretty great place for recreation and outdoor stuff. It's actually turning out to be a really great place to build a business, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. So thank you. Oh, my name is David Back. I hope that's not too loud. Um, so I previously, I started the first car rental company in India. Uh, until 10 years ago, you could only rent a car uh, in India with a chauffeur. And if you wanted uh, what they call self-drive car rental, which there means you drive yourself, <laughs> it, was, it was only available in the uh, unlicensed gray market. So cash only, no insurance. Um, I'd never actually even been to India before, but I moved there. I started this company. Uh, many ups and downs, but now it's in about 100 cities in India and um, four other countries, uh, Egypt, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. Uh, more recently, um, I was, I was in, living in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I moved back to Denver where I grew up uh, two and a half years ago to help my sick parents out. Timing was very lucky. I got here just before the pandemic, December 2019, and then maybe I'm sorry, maybe I'm rambling too long, but um, 
so my very first job had been as a cashier at Tattered Cover when I was 15. And I was a really mediocre cashier, but <laughs> I was daydreaming on the job about what I would do when one day I owned the bookstore. And I came back here, I was helping my parents out, and COVID hit, and on a hunch, I thought Tattered Cover must be in trouble, and I cold emailed the owners, and they responded in 45 minutes and said they were absolutely desperate to sell immediately. <laughs> I was like, oh, you nerds, you're, su <laughs> you're supposed to negotiate. Um, but, but now I'm, I'm one of the owners and the chairman, and um, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Um, my name is Abby Pickle, and I am a rural entrepreneur, and so that is my part in this. And I am getting ready to fundraise, um, but to give you a little background on me, I am a co-founder and CEO of a company called Zombies Footwear. And we are launching first quarter of 2023, but we're a footwear company for healthcare workers by healthcare workers. And our niche in the market started because of um, creating and inventing the first ever active antimicrobial outsole by um, embedding copper nanoparticles in vulcanized rubber. And so all of that happens in our headquarters in Buena Vista, Colorado. And so I have had a lot of help with the EDC up there. And that is how I've met Jake and was invited to speak to you all because maybe I'm a little more relatable um, because I am a little less experienced than everyone else up here. So that is who I am. Well, and I already know that we've got somebody from Silverthorne here. So I think maybe they can relate a little bit to your story. Woohoo! Anybody else from like different places outside of Denver? Yeah, where are you from? All right, yeah. What about you? Raise your hand. Fort Collins. Fort Collins. Okay. Awesome. Nice. Very cool. Awesome. So we got a little diversity in the. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's welcome. a little. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Denver Startup Week's going going nationwide. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to take a guess that most of you guys are here because you saw the title of this session and you're like, hmm, I'd like to help mobilize startup and angel investing ecosystems in my community. Is, is that a fair guess? Is, is that pretty, pretty spot on for why you guys are here? If you guys have different reasons for being here, you can also let us know in the Q&A. <laughs> we're, we're a pretty strong panel here, so you can ask, ask us any questions. Um, so cool. Um, yeah, and, and basically, before we get kind of going into the panel part, um, I'd just like to queue up a few thoughts around like how you as an individual or as an organization can be thinking about how to do this, how to mobilize startup and angel investing ecosystems in any community. So, I think a lot of people are afraid of the idea of venture capital um, in their community because they have this um, preconceived notion that, well, you know, investing is this thing where people lose money nine times out of 10, um, and that's just not true. Um, so let's talk about how this strategy works. So when we think about what Rocky's Venture Club does, and I said this at the beginning that I'd get back to this, um, we're more than just an angel investing group. Um, who here is familiar with Rocky's Venture Club? Sweet. Awesome, about three quarters of the room. So for the other quarter of the room who's never heard of us before, we are <laughs> the um, longest running and one of the most active angel investing groups in the country with almost 200 active angel investors. Um, and we do about 30 investments a year. Um, and on top of that, um, we exist to accelerate economic development by educating and connecting both investors and entrepreneurs. Um, and we do that in a number of ways, uh, as you can see by the number of logos that we have here um, on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, we do quite a bit of things, and I'm going to get to that in the next slide here. Um, so as you can see here, this is kind of a snapshot of how a startup ecosystem um, might look. You can see there's a lot of different uh, pieces. There's funders, startup organizations, events, corporations, accelerators, um, government, uh, universities and colleges, federal labs. Um, 
So it's, it's pretty diverse. Um, I'm going to ask for this slide later. This is helpful. Right? <laughs> well, you can, you can thank Energize Colorado for putting this together. Um, and then you can see where we put our logos in um, to show where we kind of operate within this ecosystem. Um, so Rockies Venture Club is actually three organizations in one. So like I just said, we have the club, which is the angel investing side of things. Um, we also have the Rockies Venture Institute, which is a 501c3 nonprofit um, that focuses on education. And I cannot reiterate this enough. Education is really the key for creating um, startup ecosystems. So the Institute puts on programs like our Hyper Accelerator, um, which is actually supported by the EDA and OEdit, um, which if anybody's familiar, that's the Colorado Office of, yay! <laughs> we got somebody here from OEdit. Um, Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade, um, which is an amazing organization that gives out grant money to promising startups um, that are uh, building businesses in Colorado. So definitely an awesome program to look into. Um, but thanks to them, we can put on our one week long hyper accelerator program for free to Colorado startups. Um, so we don't take equity, which is amazing because a lot of other accelerator programs do. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, we, we actually have one coming up. So if you're interested, deadline's October 5th. Um, it's coming up October 31st through November 4th. Um, and you can ask us about that later. Um, but we also do an angel accelerator um, once a quarter. Um, and this is a thing that people don't often think about, um, that we need to educate angel investors just as much um, as we need to educate entrepreneurs. Because um, angel investors don't always come in knowing how to be good angel investors. Um, and it's not obvious. So even if you started your own business, uh, grown it to be worth millions, um, and, you know, gotten hundreds of employees and even exited, um, you still need special skills to be a successful angel investor. Um, and David, I think, has some firsthand experience in this that he might speak to in a little bit. Um, <laughs> so on top of that, we do a lot of other events. Um, we have two annual conferences, uh, and we do special events like Colorado Life Science Night. Um, so we're always putting on these topical events, and if we don't know something, or if we feel like there's a topic that um, people need education on, um, we'll put together an event and get a lot of smart people in the room um, to, to learn about that topic. So quantum computing, that's the next one. <laughs> we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna put that one together. Um, so in any case, this is where we're working. We're working in investment, in education, um, in events. Uh, we also do technical assistance. And this all works together uh, to create a vibrant startup ecosystem. So here's how we think about somebody um, with a job like Jake's. Uh, who's juggling a lot of different things, and um, there's these kind of metaphorical toolkits uh, available to economic developers. Um, and I think there's a lot of folks who don't realize that they actually have a lot more tools in their toolkit um, than they might have thought. So this idea of mobilizing local capital to invest in local business is one of those tools. So a lot of traditional economic development uses like taxpayer money and grants um, to put on programs and, um, and try to create jobs. And you know, there's a place for that and it's really great and, um, and they do some amazing things. But there's also this kind of way of thinking about it where um, instead of thinking like you gotta use a hammer that you know, is kind of this traditional um, blunt force way of, you know, forcing economic development in a community. We like to think about it as using a lever. Um, and by putting a relatively small amount of support into education and mobilizing local capital, uh, we can take private equity and invest it in companies to create jobs. So this leveraged approach is a way that communities can be creating jobs at a much more accelerated pace. And we call this locavesting. Um, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with like farm to table and eat local. Um, and you know, we think that the same sort of thing happens with investing because people really love investing in their local communities. Um, you know, it gives them a sense of meaning and connectedness um, as well as economic returns. 
So we've been doing some research here at RVC on what impact angel investing has on job growth. And we found literally thousands of angel deals nationwide um, and what kinds of jobs directly resulted from those. And over about the last six years, uh, it's ranged from as little as $80,000 to $110,000 of angel investment per job. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's, a, that's a good ratio. Uh, and when you think about it as an economic development organization, um, you know, you may be supporting angel investing and education programs, you know, with like $5,000 or less per job since most of that investment is actually coming from private capital. Um, and there are also a lot of other changes that, you know, hold on. <laughs> so backing up here. Um, the Kauffman Foundation actually has this really amazing statistic that shows that most jobs, um, you know, we like to think that, you know, it's the Fortune 500 companies and, and small business that are creating all the jobs. Well, it turns out that uh, most of the jobs that were shed in the last decade came from Fortune 500 companies, and most of the new jobs that were created were from startups. Um, so this is really the best place to be investing in terms of overall job creation and to be if you're also um, somebody looking for a job. And there are lots of other um, changes that people might not know about, um, but when you think about angel investing, I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, I have to be an accredited investor, um, which by definition means that uh, you either have to have a million dollars in investable uh, assets other than your primary residence or $200,000 in annual income, um, which, you know, is, is kind of hard for most people. <laughs> it makes angel investing a little, um, you know, out there um, because of this income or asset restriction. But in 2020, um, the SEC actually passed a new law that allows anyone to become an accredited investor by knowledge instead of by assets or income. Um, so you can take this 130 question exam, the uh, Series 65 uh, FINRA, um, and as long as you've you know, uh, done your homework and, and you know, learned about the um, regulatory risks and about investing, um, you can take that exam and become an accredited investor regardless of your income or your assets. And this is a really big game changer, um, especially in rural communities, um, because it allows people to invest in their community even if they weren't already a millionaire. Isn't that awesome? Let me step in and say, this, is, this actually is a like, big change. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been like a joke for decades that whether or not you're considered a sophisticated investor is just based on how much money you have in your bank account yeah. versus how much knowledge you have. So this is, this is huge. Thanks, David. Awesome. And, um, you know, one thing that I'd really like to stress here um, is that this isn't Shark Tank. Um, so this is a logo that we use a lot. <laughs> um, you know, we're Colorado, um, we're friendly, we're collaborative, we like to work together, um, even for people coming from Seattle. Uh, you know, we <laughs> we're, we're very welcoming here. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, I mean, we just don't do sharky things. And in fact, in fact, we, we work with the Denver SBDC to put on a thing called tr Trout Tank. Um, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that's a really important part of our philosophy uh, that we come together collaboratively um, and that there are a lot of ways that we can do that. And one of those is through uh, education and teaching the same tools, the same language, uh, the same methodology to both investors and entrepreneurs uh, so that we can have this transparent community all working together. Um, so we put this slide in um, to talk about for you know, a lot of people, they, their first intuition is like, well, let's put on a big pitch event. Um, and I just wanna say that, you know, having a big pitch event, it's, it's great. It's part of that overall strategy of activating a community. Um, but in and of itself, it's kind of guaranteed to fail um, because investors don't feel confident um, and they're not going to write a check based off of a first impression, you know, from hearing a pitch. Um, so it's like a myth that you know they're just gonna take out their checkbook and, and write you a check right after their uh, right after the pitch. Um, so having a pitch event is a great thing, 
um, once you've done these other parts of a successful startup ecosystem. And um, this idea uh, or this principle that finding angels in a community that's also kind of a total myth, um, because in a lot of communities, there aren't a lot of angel investors to be found and mobilized. Um, and in most cases, we have to create new angels. Uh, and this is an important part of understanding how a startup ecosystem is created. Um, so how do you create angels? <laughs> well, you, you find the people who are interested uh, in getting into this space, and then you build educational content uh, and programs around that and, and really get them working together. So again, this you know, educational programming um, is really key to creating and activating the angel side of the equation. <laughs> he just bumped up my volume. <laughs> and the, it's also important for the startup side of the equation, um, which Jake, David, and Abby are gonna uh, speak to here in a moment. Um, So another myth about angel capital, um, and I'm sure you've all heard this, and I mentioned it earlier, is that nine times out of 10, you're gonna lose all your money. And that scares a lot of people off uh, from angel or venture capital investing. Um, and the sad thing is that this is like not a statistic that exists for venture funds or angels. Um, maybe it's happened to one or two, but they must have been really bad at what they did. <laughs> no offense. Um, but. <laughs> But across the, the board, people do a lot better um, that, you know, than they think. And you know, there are risks, but they're you know, a lot less than you might think. So, <laughs> um, angels who invest in groups, um, who are getting this wisdom of crowds and um, benefiting from the collective intelligence uh, and expertise of a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds and experience and knowledge, um, they do quite a bit better than people who invest by themselves. Um, so in fact, <laughs> um, there's a 27% IRR uh, return for uh, angels who invest in groups versus only 7% IRR uh, return on investment for angels investing alone. Um, so mobilizing angels in a group is a really important part of the strategy, which Jake is going to speak to here in a second. Taking a second here. You get to look at the minions jumping up and down. Party, woo! Okay, why is it getting tripped up? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so here's a look at what the real distributions are. Um, and these are pretty true across the board for angel investing in groups. Um, so this comes from Reed Research out of Willamette University. Uh, and you can see on this left-hand side um, <laughs> that you know, there's returns of less than $1 um, per $1 invested, which you know, it's not so great, it's about 50%, which is risky. Um, but then when you look on the right-hand side, you can see that progressively there are returns in the one to five, five to 10, uh, 10 to 30, and 30 times your investment. So net, net overall, Angels are seeing returns in the 20 to 30% range. Um, and we don't have a slide on it, but there's also um, a, a new, or actually renewed uh, tax credit for angel investors from the state of Colorado um, that allows you uh, a 25% re rebate on your investment. So basically you're only putting up 75% of your investment um, that's, that's kind of you know, at risk uh, instead of 100%. Um, and there are also IRS uh, tax codes that mean that you can, you know, you can get returns tax-free, and if you lose your money, you can write it off in the same year. So um, there's lots of benefits here above and beyond the fact that um, you know, these return distributions are more attractive than most people might have previously thought. So I'll just wrap up here um, by giving you guys some perspective about angel investing in the state of Colorado. Um, there are actually about 68,000 accredited angel investors, um, but only maybe 1,000 of them are actually active angel investors. Um, so we've got a goal. Uh, we're not going to try to mobilize all 67,000 um, unactive uh, accredited investors. Um, 
And, you know, but every community has these investors, uh, and they're probably not the people that you're thinking about. They're, you know, probably not the guys driving around in Maseratis. Um, they're, they're probably the ones wearing uh, tattered t-shirts and wearing flip-flops, um, and they're just, you know, your next-door neighbor who, um, you know, happens to be pretty well off and doesn't flaunt their, uh, their wealth. Um, but they're, you know, here everywhere in Colorado, um, and our goal is to mobilize those folks and create a vibrant community for angel investing, um, which supports startups and ultimately economic development and job creation in Colorado. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Jake. Hi. <laughs> is this working pretty well? It should be. Cool. It was just the minion slide that hung it up because it yep. was, you know. Too much activity. Yeah. 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 Um, well, thank you so much for the, the kind of overview on that. I'll say I've had the good fortune of, I'm hearing like a ringing, are you? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, cool. Um, I've had the good fortune of working with RBC as a partner in eco de ecosystem development pro uh, strategies for about a decade. And they were at one of the first calls I made when I moved up to the mountains. And I guess just to share a little bit of my background, um, it's really nice to be back here at Denver Startup Week. I worked in the metro area for about 12 years prior to moving up to the mountains. Um, started and operated accelerator programs in three different kind of sub-industries. So health tech, uh, internet of things, and then smart cities and was loving my life here, frankly, like loved my professional life, but have a couple young kids and they were getting to school age and wanted a different lifestyle for them. And so moved up to Salida uh, about two years ago, two and a half, and had no intentions of finding meaningful work in my field in that area. Um, obviously it's not known to be a big startup or entrepreneurial place, um, but what I found once I got up there was that they, the, those communities and many mountain communities are actively looking at how to diversify their local economy, become less reliant on tourism and visitorship, which carries with it some pretty substantial challenges for those small communities. And I would also say that some of the macro trends that have happened in the world over the last two years, the proliferation of remote work, um, the access to capital uh, changes, some of which we just talked about, have made this the best time, I would argue, to start up and grow a company in a rural place. In the world of capital, in the world of talent, the world is really flat in a lot of ways that it wasn't just a few years ago. And so the thesis that we're working on is that these same approaches that work for cultivating innovation and job creation in industry verticals in a major metro area are also applicable as a diversification and resilient strategy. So that's kind of the context. I had the benefit of 10, 10 years of, of network building here. So being able to lean on organizations like RBC has allowed us to, to stand up this effort really fast. And I wanted to kind of just show you a little bit of what that looks like in our area. Um, a little bit of background, the EDC is a 10-year-old public-private partnership, nonprofit economic development group funded by the, the major employers in Chafee County in the Central Mountains, and then also some public funding. Um, it's definitely known as a recreation spot, but over the last couple of years, about a thousand, we estimate, uh, remote workers have moved from the metro area out there, and it's it's changing the face of that community. And there are perceived positive and negative aspects of that, but in our our world, that's a once in a generation opportunity for brain gain into a place that was uh, historically pretty slow growing. Um, and so in addition to the entrepreneurial support stuff that we will talk about here today, we also engage on basically talent pipeline activities for those local employers and then engage in public policy. Um, but for us, so this, the strategy around diversifying the economy there through entrepreneurship is, is kind of done under this Central Mountain Entrepreneurs banner. Uh, we had the good fortune of raising uh, air, or attaining grant funding of about a quarter million dollars to run this program for the first two years, so we're about a year into that two-year process. And we 
started by you know, building community around this, like gathering community support for entrepreneurship generally. Um, it has always been an entrepreneurial place, it's valued there, but really cultivating that um, activity. We started out with doing the social aspects of that, bringing together entrepreneurs, starting to bring some of the latent capital off the sidelines, um, and bringing in folks to kind of like just elevate the vibration, like, but you know, inspiring speakers, including um, uh, some folks that are very familiar here, including Peter Adams from RVC. Um, so bringing Peter up there to start to educate that community, like this is, this is how local capital can impact these efforts. And it was just great. Like the, the way that people responded to this stuff was phenomenal. In basically six months time, we were able to design, launch, brand an accelerator program, cultivate or, or recruit the first cohort of 10 companies, and we'll show you a little bit of that, um, run them through an eight-week accelerator program using a bunch of resources from, from the metro area and local and national resources or locations. The vibe was high and um, really fun to work in that and made, you know, strove to make that activity like very aligned with the local culture. It was a lot of great beer, whiskey, um, live music, like making these events fun in a way that I think a lot of people were surprised by. The accelerator program itself was basically, it's not, a, it's not all that different than the accelerator programs you might be comfortable with or familiar with here, um, but basically, you know, growth, basics. So bringing in subject matter expertise around all these different act assets or uh, aspects of how to grow a business quickly. Um, we, the cohort itself is, um, it, so again, for the first year program, we wanted that program to reflect the local community. There was some concern of like, okay, this is a totally new concept in a new area. Um, the, the perception was that entrepreneurship was, you know, two kids in hoodies sitting in a basement writing code. And, and that's, not, that's not what entrepreneurship looks like there naturally. That's part of it. And we'll, we'll be cultivating more of that over time too. But it was brewers, distillers, product companies, outdoor industry companies, um, environmental related uh, startup activity, um, consumer packaged goods. So basically like very broad in its industry and stage for that first year, but we've selected all brands that were, uh, and brands and companies that were known and respected in those communities. And it generated a lot of excitement and a lot of, I think, early faith in this approach. Um, and then obviously the mentor network is the, it's really the, engine behind this stuff. Um, we had the good benefit of myself and my partners who are working on this project, having run accelerator programs here, we were able to tap into a bunch of kind of statewide resources right from the jump, recruited 30 mentors in a month's time uh, prior to the program starting. And there's a lot of familiar faces here for folks that are involved with Denver Startup Week. but. Um, and then ran that program over the winter and then had a big kind of celebratory um, community event to again just kind of celebrate the progress of those companies and um, start to educate you know, or continue to educate the community on what's possible with this approach. I want to call attention to this. This gentleman is um, Charlie Chupp. He's the founder of a company called Fading West in BV uh, in our area and they are they do factory built housing. It's nothing like what you might consider to be like modular um, or offsite housing. But basically this, they have a 130,000 square foot factory that turns out a house a day. And they have, you know, in this uh, housing crisis that exists in much of this country, you can't stick build your way out of the deficit that we've created. And so alternative forms of housing development are needed. And this company happens to have found itself kind of at the vanguard of that. So really just like highlighting stories like that 
to inspire other entrepreneurs in the community to, to get involved and grow businesses there. Started selling out events, like there's really just like high energy around what's possible in our community. Uh, we had uh, one of our speakers, for example, we brought in Koel Tomei, the founder of Nusi Yogurt, who basically took a company, or, you know, took an idea to a $200 million a year yogurt startup. Um, and so again, just kind of showing that like what's possible. And this is, this is the first cohort. Again, brewers, distillers, outdoor industry companies, entrepreneurship is alive and well in the mountains, but it does look a little bit different than it does here. Um, and then finally, so we're now kind of thinking about, okay, so proof of concept exists, it's working. Um, we, as part of this, obviously access to capital is a big piece. With RVC's help, we've, uh, it, the, you know, Chafee County in the Central Mountains, like much of Colorado's like mountain communities, a lot of second homeowners, um, a lot of folks who are there working remotely that have done big things professionally elsewhere. And the second we started like actively seeking out those individuals to encourage them to start investing in local companies, like in six months time, we first, we found and identified and engaged with the first 10 of those local investors. Um, this summer, they made their first three investments it, modest in size, it was about 350,000 in three deals uh, over the past two months. But we feel like that's also kind of proof of concept for that approach. And what's interesting in the context of this discussion is it was, we now meet monthly and it was probably three or four meetings before the, this group of investors even started talking about the returns to be expected, the structure of the fund or deals, it was all about like, how can we positively impact this community through our, you know, both financial resources and expertise. But it's come together, I think, faster than I had anticipated. We've built Angel Networks in on the front range a couple of times. This is moving faster than that. I don't, couldn't say exactly why, uh, but we're really excited about that approach to like be that catalyst for job creation in that area. Um, Central Mountain Angels is the name of that group. Um, and again, growing. And I just wanted to put this up there too. So a key part of this for us, so we talked a little bit about the proliferation of remote work. Can, I cannot overstate like for the impact of that on rural areas or mountain communities is massive. It comes with some pressure. Um, it's probably impacting some of the like housing value increases that have happened in communities like ours. But the net impact of bringing in, again, you know, we're a county of 20,000, bringing in roughly 1,000 new, well-educated, high-earning uh, professionals that are bringing in kind of a, a global perspective into a community like that is a game changer. And because of that kind of access to capital and access to talent, we are really excited about what's possible over the next few years and onward. Um, we're easy to find. Um, if we are seeking both investors and mentors for this program, we're about to spin up our second cohort of 10 in a couple months. And uh, so if there are folks in the room who want to participate in that, we would love it. That's my jam. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, that was awesome. Cool, thank you. Like, uh, well, okay, so actually, uh, I'll start by sort of transitioning right off of that. And I wanna say, um, I, I am really impressed by Denver Startup Week. And I think, um, uh, you know, I wanna ask for a round of applause for the, wait, for all parts of it. So like these cool panelists, the organizers, all the participants, and that means all of you. Like this whole week has been pretty amazing. So yeah. please, please put your hands together. And, and particularly why I want to say that is um, I've seen this ecosystem build from nothing. I grew up in Denver. Uh, the first startup I tried to start uh, that went absolutely nowhere was in 2007. It was a clean tech startup. It was way too ambitious. I, I was living in Philadelphia where I'd gone to undergrad. I was trying to raise money in Philadelphia and Denver. There was no money in Philadelphia <laughs> or Denver. 
And um, something that's changed between now and then, if you wanted to raise money from Silicon Valley or something like that, like you had to go to Silicon Valley. Like nobody was gonna give you money based on a phone call or, or, or video meeting. And look at this ecosystem now. Like this is a real ecosystem, a total complete trans transformation in 15 years. And uh, I've seen that happen in a lot of places. Um, I mean, I've been in really hot ecosystems like the Bay Area and Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I've also seen e ecosystems like here in Philly build from nothing, and I've seen mid-sized ecosystems like Bangalore build into major ecosystems. So I, based on everything that I just heard, I would not be surprised if Chafee County, like 15 years from now, yeah. is a very... I mean, it sounds like it's already a legit ecosystem, it's but I wouldn't starting. be surprised if it was a very, very legit ecosystem. So, like, watch this space, right? Exactly. And so, you know, think about the world as a as a movie, not as a not as a picture. Yeah. Um, okay, that's where I wanted to start. Uh, now, speaking about my my own experience fundraising and whatever advice I might offer to to founders who are fundraising. Uh, so, I've raised I've I've raised money for two really insane businesses and two very different insane businesses. And so my number one message that I would have for everybody here, and I think it's particularly relevant talking about um, th the sort of economic diversity of the entire state of Colorado, is that there's not, one si there's not a one size fits all model. Um, so I've literally been, uh, personally rejected by over 500 investors. Uh, it's probably a better track record than my dating life. <laughs> um, well, um, but, but I wanna say the, the, the investors who I got for my first company and for my second company could not be more different, and that's because the companies could not be more different. So for my ultra high risk, high growth potential company in India. Um, the in angel investors were people like Larry Summers, and then uh, Sequoia invested, Ford Motor Company invested, uh, Mahindra, which is a big Indian car company and conglomerate invested, the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund invested. Again, this, this but these, uh, within the context of 500 rejections. And also for that company, time zones was a nightmare. I had investors on the West Coast, East Coast, Europe, Middle East, India, Singapore, and Australia. So I, like, I would either have to be up at midnight for phone calls or up at 4 a.m. for investor phone calls. I was not, I wouldn't set that up again if I could, <laughs> if I could do it all over. But you know, when you need money, you need money. Um, for tattered cover, like I didn't even try Sequoia, like <laughs> come on. Um, but what I heard from like even even people I like um, individ even e individual angel investors who I'd made a lot of money for with Zoom Car, when I brought the tattered cover idea to them, they were like, "Look, David, we thought your <laughs> they were like we thought your last thing was crazy." And we were like willing to take chance on it and it worked out, but like you're buying a physical chain of brick and mortar bookstores like during a pandemic, like this is really crazy. And I do have one, I have one I really appreciate. One, uh, my best friend from undergrad is the only crossover Zoom car tattered cover investor. Um, and right, yeah, he, man, he has an appetite for risk. Oh my God. Um, no, but the money that came for Tattered Cover was people who mostly, about two-thirds of the money from Tattered Cover was from people who already knew Tattered Cover. Uh, people like Tattered Cover's landlords, uh, local business leaders like the Gart family or uh, Dick Monfort, the, order, the owner of the Colorado Rockies. Um, some people from the publishing industry in New York, people who recognize, like people who knew the magic of tattered cover and understood that it had been in slow decline uh, for a long time while actually there was 
a renaissance in the independent book industry, and that Tattered Cover could retake its place as the best bookstore in the Western Hemisphere with the right leadership. Um, and so this capital, it was either very local or it was within, within the industry. And so just completely, like, so my message really is like, one size does not fit all, and part of your job as an entrepreneur and as a leader is to recognize what situation you're in, and therefore to try to find um, investors and employees and partners and customers and everything that's appropriate to your particular situation. Um, now, I, and I think capital has gotten more, more global than it was. And so an entrepreneur in Denver, in Denver or even an entrepreneur in Buena Vista has more options about where they can get the capital than they did before, but they still should be thoughtful about where they're getting the capital. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, I don't know, I might, I'm, I'm gonna say something that might, might get me in trouble with my other panelists, but, um, Another thing that I experienced, I, this is perhaps, I think capital has gotten more global than it over the past decade. So uh, what I, my personal experience is gonna be a little different today than it would have been then. Um, when I was raising money for Zoomcar, what I, we, we, I would often get simultaneous offers of investment from different investors. And there would, they're basically like, Initially, the gap is closed here, but I got simultaneous offers from Indian investors and New York investors for my seed round and for my A round, and the valuation from the New York investors was two and a half X, the valuation from the Indian investors. And it was very clear there was like an India price, there was a Silicon Valley, like there's a Silicon Valley price which would have been even better, there was a New York price, there would have been a Denver price that would have been probably at that time closer to the, the India price. So like where you, like it's good to have money that's local, but depending where your locality is, there might be some downsides to that as well. I think, I think look, India now is comparable to Silicon Valley. That gap is closed. I still think there's probably a Denver price versus a Silicon Valley price and there's probably a Salida price versus a Denver price. Um, and so again, I, I would say to the entrepreneurs, like, okay, there's always gonna be trade-offs, so you have to recognize what situation you're in and what trade-offs you're willing to take. Uh, something, th this, this, this crazy risk taker who's the friend who invests in both my companies, uh, what was interesting is um, he was the first Zoom car investor, but he, sa he said, I've never angel invested before. I don't know anything about this. Like, I don't want to negotiate this deal with you. Just know that you have a commitment from me for $20,000. And as soon as you find a credible angel investor <laughs> who can like negotiate this deal, I'll invest at whatever terms he negotiates with you. So, okay, so now I'm gonna kind of, like I say, twist this a little bit and say to Abby, you are a rural entrepreneur, but you're not building a rural product, right? You, you, your company seems different from at least two thirds of the companies that you listed as part of your, yep. your cohort, right? And so I think for those distilleries and those breweries and those uh, outdoor recreation companies or those f local forestry companies. Local money is so helpful because those are like local business leaders. Those are people who are gonna like actually use your product or service and then rave about it to their friends and then all of that. Um, your market like should be national from day one, right? Oh, it's it already, global, it okay. Is. It already is, okay, yes, 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 good, that's right. And so, lo, lo, like the, the downside of local money for you, of the valuation and stuff, like I think 
again, like totally makes sense for those companies to raise money locally. But for you, like you might want to raise money from a mix of sources. Like if you can raise money in Denver and get better terms, yeah. or if you can, you know, do the research and find all the investors that are investing in footwear or who are investing in however many different segments um, and pitch them wherever they are in the world. Like if you can get a Silicon Valley lead and then like a bunch of other investors from Colorado who are willing to follow that lead, that would be like an amazing situation for you. <laughs> All right, Denver investors. Okay, Denver investors, let's see. <laughs> right, but, but, right. but again, to say, like, um, you know, rec try to recognize the situation you're in, try to find, uh, like, I, um, and different investors of mine provided all different kinds of value. Um, you know, Sequoia provided a certain kind of professionalism and credibility, whereas Mahindra, our first like real local partner, like Mahindra was such a good partner, helping us with the government, helping us with all this other stuff. Um, so, you know, again, you have to identify your own situation, identify your own challenges, identify beyond just cash in the bank, what additive value you're trying to get from, from your investors and then seek that out. Um, I don't know how I possibly could follow one of the partial owners of Tattered Cover. <laughs> um, Your company sounds less crazy. <laughs> I don't know. Buckle up. Um, how many people here are entrepreneurs? And how many people here are investors? A few. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, I'm not really necessarily here to talk about my company because that's not really what this forum is about. If you want to hear about my company, stick around. I'd be happy to show you how I pitch, uh, how I've learned to pitch, or pitch to you, <laughs> investors who are here. Um, so a couple of things. I Just to kind of jump on everything that we've talked about here today, I started my company almost four years ago. It's kind of a long story. I'm a nurse practitioner for UC Health, and I am starting a footwear company. How? How is this even happening? This is nothing having to do with my training. Um, I started this company because I have a son with a chronic skin disease. And um, my son ended up getting sick with an antibiotic-resistant bacteria that's common in hospital settings. Um, I have never been infected with this, and it was something I brought home on my clothing. My kids live on the floor. I don't know about yours. I feel like mine are extra wild regardless. Um, I also can't stand not wearing shoes in my own home. One thing that you don't realize is OSHA has no designation to footwear in the healthcare setting here in the United States. The nurses, the doctors, everybody that you're seeing um, in the hospital setting, next time you're there, hopefully just visiting someone, um, look around at their shoes. They're wearing the same shoes you're wearing. Brooks, Hoka you name it. And not only are they wearing it in the clinical setting, they're wearing it at home. They're wearing it in mass transit. They're wearing them when they're picking their kids up at daycare. They're wearing them in and out of EMS situations coming in and out of homes. It's a big problem. There's different um, antimicrobial textiles coming out for healthcare workers, but nobody's addressing shoes. Right now, each of your shoes have at least 400,000 different bacteria on them. Gross, right? Here's the crazy thing about shoes. They're their own ecosystem. What else? <laughs> it's true. What else are you stepping in? And what is feeding that bacteria that these colonies are just growing like crazy? It's a big deal. Um, regardless, 90% of that, when you walk in your house, gets left in your house. I don't know if you have kids crawling on your floor, if you're vacuuming and things are getting aerosolized. It's real, it's a problem, and it hadn't been addressed. I started shopping and looking around for something that was antimicrobial that I could wear at my house, and I couldn't find anything. So I decided to try making it. Why not, right? 
if, if you know, Dyson can do it, I can make something in my garage. Um, so after, you know, kind of using my chemistry background too to figure out how in the world am I going to do this without um, increasing antibiotic resistant. I can't put antibiotics on the bottom of shoes. Um, so I had to find an element that's antimicrobial. Uh, three blenders and a food processor later, after I had um, crunched up a bunch of copper in my garage, I learned how to vulcanize copper um, in rubber to make the most amazing outsole in the world, um, and then worked with a bunch of helpers to patent the technology. I live in Buena Vista, Colorado. There's like 3,000-ish people there. Um, there's not a big startup area for footwear, right? Um, so what did I have to do? I asked for help. I asked so many people for help. Um, I found the most amazing intellectual property judge on the pickleball court in Buena Vista <laughs> who helped me write the patent. I um, met different footwear executives through working with EDC to introduce me to people from Nike and Crocs and Columbia to help me figure out how to make these incredible shoes. Um, so a couple things that I just want to address as an entrepreneur and try and encourage all of the entrepreneurs in the room. Uh, still pre-revenue, haven't launched my company yet, um, but entrepreneurship is lonely. And if you are here trying to figure out how to um, you know, get funding from your local community, First of all, it's, it's hard to ask people for money in general, or at least it is for me. But what I will say is just asking people for help and talking to people in your local community, you never know if you're going to have the most world-renowned IP judge out on the pickleball court, um, or if someone from your EDC can introduce you to a designer from Nike who can help you make your you know, product or, or whatever it ends up being. Um, I have gotten one check for my company, one check and one check alone. Uh, remember what my product is? That came from a farmer. A farmer wrote me a check um, to help with my company because not because he cares about the product, um, because he believed in me. And when you are an entrepreneur raising early, um, as I obviously have so much experience with this, as I'm new, what I will say is the best connections that I have made with people is being authentic, keeping your integrity, and being humble. You don't know what you don't know, and it's okay to ask for help. And um, I, I don't know what else to say apart from, I, if you have any questions for me or any ways I can help you, um, I am right in it with you. And it's super hard and scary, and um, I think, I think getting local investment is huge um, because you want to give back to the community that you live in. And no, my factory is actually in Taipei City, Taiwan, and working with a third-party logistics company in Denver, Colorado, et cetera, et cetera. But I do want to give back to my community. I do want to hire in my, in, within my community to help me as much as I can and benefit my community, even if my company doesn't directly affect my community. I'm not a brewer. Uh, I won't pretend to be, and I can barely take a shot of whiskey without feeling like I'm going to throw up. So I don't know that I belong in, in you know, the community I'm in, but I do want, I want to involve my community in my company, even though I'm direct to consumer and online. And so I would just encourage you to get out there and meet people in your community. You never know who's going to write you a check or believe in you or help you. And so just be, get out there, be authentic, have high integrity, and ask for help. So. Hey, I want to give another round of applause because if you think about today in the culture with like a cult, the cult of the founder, how many entrepreneurs are preaching humility from the state? So let's. Yes. And I'll just say from like an investor's perspective, like that is exactly what we want to hear. We want to hear these stories. We want to hear that you're, you know, getting out there and talking to all of the people that you possibly can and asking for help because that shows that you're a coachable 
founder, um, that you're willing to put in the work. That you, there's all these great qualities um, that you know an investor you know finds really attractive in that kind of a, a story. And and I'd say that that's why like a show like Shark Tank has done so incredibly well is because they highlight these kinds of stories of you know people um, making vulcanized rubber in their garages and you know in in very like offbeat places that you know nobody's ever heard of or very few people have and um, the challenge with Shark Tank and that's why you know a place like Rocky's Venture Club exists is that they just make really sharky deals you know they're asking for like 50% or 51% of the um, founders company and it leaves so little um, you know ownership left for the founder um, that they have no motivation to carry it forward to you know put in the the hard days because it's like well I don't own my company anymore um, and so that's where the educational piece comes in to play and is is so incredibly important um, educating both sides of the equation. So with that, I'd love to open it up to questions. We've got about 20 minutes here for questions, and I do have a mic, or we can even... You've got a nice booming voice. Perfect. Finding and identifying them, obviously, is, is the first piece of that. Um, I would say that, like, the shared love of place, wherever you are, um, is a great mutual ground. Um, that's what we've found, like, obviously we're leveraging a pretty unique place, um, but identifying that kind of shared value around, like, love of place is a phenomenal piece. Less reliant upon serendipity, like, specific Well, I think find, finding organizations that are already organizing those individuals, I mean, this Denver, um, I believe that it's becoming one of the better connected ecosystems in the country. And there, there's a proliferation of ecosystem builders who have that kind of macro view of who's playing in that market and tapping into those organizations. And RBC is obviously one of the best here. Um, but I, I would say that's a faster way to kind of get there. Yeah. So, Denver startup was a meet, and there's right here in five days worth of events, so many things happening, so many great people working out of the woodworks. Next week, they'll go back to the woods. Uh, <laughs> and then all the information will be centered around like your, your colleges, accelerators, incubators, uh, angel groups, those independent angels who uh, are more likely to kind of take that chance on you without being. Is your assumption that there's not a super rich ecosystem of like those engagement opportunities? Because yeah. my, my perception is actually kind of a, kind of the opposite. I feel like they're like almost on a daily basis, at least here on the front range. Like there's some in, like special interest group with a certain focus, whether it's the investing piece or like a certain industry vertical or something like that, I kind of feel like there's a wealth of those opportunities. I, I, I wanna, that's exactly what I was gonna say. I mean, uh, actually, um, I did not know, I'd never heard of the building that we're in right now. And uh, when I came here, I assumed it was part of like CU Denver or, or whatever. Um, but they explained to me, no, this is actually a facility that's owned by the city of Denver for promoting startup entrepreneurship and that they have co-working space and they have events and I was like wow okay I shame on me 
for not knowing about this place. Now I know, now I'm gonna be back here to take advantage of this resource. So I think, um, to, to, to both of you, I sort of, I, okay, so my whole spiel was that there's not one size fits all advice. So I'll give you one little bit of one size fits all advice. <laughs> no, 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 but, which is like, there's a lot of resources available and I think it's on you guys to seek them out because they're being offered to you. But then I also want to twist things and say, because you guys are asking general questions about money and entrepreneurship, and in order to actually give you good advice, I feel like I'd have to ask, what industries are you in? Okay, thanks for explaining this. Please go on. No, no, I mean, sincerely, thank you for explaining this. I was wrong, so please. I was literally going to pass the microphone over to her now that I now that I understood what your question actually was. So I'm out. Um, I was actually kind of like, my, our crew was like, holy shit, like we're, we're maybe over networked here. And like in terms of like, okay, if the, yes, there's always going to be an element of the entrepreneurial community who needs the, that like introductory, like here's how you build a pitch deck, here's how you pitch. Um, I feel like there, I could probably name 10 organizations that teach that here currently. Um, I, I could be wrong, and, and there's always more to be done, but I feel like it's pretty good. I don't know. Maybe hearing from other entrepreneurs as to, like, do you feel well-supported here? So my name is Brett Boston, and I'm building a company called Main, M-A-I-N-N. -N. Second name is we're supercharging Main Street, and I built a SaaS Do you, when, when you're looking for those resources to populate on that platform, do you feel like there's a wealth of those resources? Yes, and nobody knows how to reach them. Yeah. That's why I build it. Cool. And in the community, there are, so I, I host a monthly event that's very similar to Denver Startup Week.
Yeah. I, I, I know there are some more comments. I want to say two quick things. First of all, um, uh, something I should have said before, actually for the vast majority of companies, angel money and venture capital money is not the right way to fund your business. But there are still a lot of resources out there to help you grow your business even if you're not seeking it. And like, you know, every city has a, a um, small business development center, right, from the Department of Commerce. Like, if you're an entrepreneur, you should check out your SBDC regardless of whether you're seeking angel funding or whatever, right? Like, um, and then I would also say, I'll give a, a plug for something that I found very helpful. Every single round of money I ever raised for Zoomcar, I was pouring over Brad Feld's blog on term sheets. And then uh, during my tire cover acquisition, I took the Techstars found, uh, uh, Foundry Group, um, I think that's the right partnership, uh, class on term sheets, um, which was taught partially by Brad Feld, which was incredible. I would recommend it if you're raising money as an entrepreneur or if you're an angel investor, I would recommend that particular course um, to understand the ins and outs of term sheets. Which one? Uh, it's called Access Mode, uh, which gives access to my box and phone directly to these people's phones. Um, so it's, I'm very excited and I'm also very scared. So I'm just going to ask you <laughs> any advice you guys have for me. Uh, my program starts on October 15th. And yes, they did ask me for my pitch deck. I'm like, oh, I don't have one. <laughs> they mean your PowerPoint slide. <laughs> I feel like I have a little bit of advice. I was able to participate in an accelerator program um, this past spring by Generator. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the company Generator. Um, and it was incredible. And it was primarily online, which was super helpful, living rurally. Um, and I learned so much. I took so much away from it. And I 
I valued my mentorship with them so much because sometimes when you have an idea for this company and you want to start it and you have no idea about operations or what do they mean by seed round? What does that even mean? Um, and so I think what I would say is just go into it with an open mind and and pretend like you know nothing you, and and just take um, take all the time you can with any mentorship you have there. Get phone numbers, get emails, and as soon as your um, your accelerator program ends. Do not lose contact with them. Um, keep following up. Keep sending emails. Keep calling. Keep making coffee dates and keep relationships going. Um, I think anybody who gets excel into any accelerator program is fortunate because that's like a super fast business school, essentially, in how to um, launch a company. And so even what you were saying about you kind of feel like you're having all of these events and almost like achieving nothing, just remember that when all those entrepreneurs are meeting together and talking and networking, that still just re re-energizes them and how hard this is and what connections do you have and even you know sharing different resources. I feel like I get re-energized when I spend time with entrepreneurs and VCs and angel investors and anyone who knows you know anything about how hard it is to start a company. So you're not you're not not achieving or teaching or, you know, it's also on the entrepreneur to um, be disciplined in business and take the time to make those connections and take the classes and work on their own business. That's on them and that's not your responsibility. Um, so maybe the, you're just not having them at the right time of day because they're bootstrapping their company and they're working three jobs to try and fund it and all of the things. So don't give up and don't lose heart because there are people who are totally getting fed by everything you're providing. Um, and good luck in your accelerator program. I'm rooting for you. It's going to be awesome. One other plug for accelerator programs is, as we actually mentioned, you know, entrepreneurship is lonely. And so a lot of times you get really, like, you know, siloed into what you're doing and just being around other people who are also working on, you know, their businesses. It's like, they might be completely different businesses, but you can learn so much from you know, that collective intelligence in a group and just having um, other people who are kind of like in the same place that you're at, you know, in your journey and you can, um, you know, share and learn a lot from each other. So um, just benefits of accelerators in general. Um, oh, we have a question. I think we're going to let uh, Sam here. She's got a resource that I'd love to um, end on so that everybody's got it. I would love to hop over one mountain range and get to, the, to get to you. I will say that the, these types of programs, there is a great one in Durango called SCAPE, and it's got an associated both accelerator, mentor network, and access to capital network. You're going to start seeing them pop up in more and more rural communities. I don't know what the infrastructure there is or if there's like maybe an organization like our economic development group there. Um, that's who I would ask about getting there. But I will say that in year two, which we're gonna launch here, probably we'll start the call for applications for that program in mid-October. That is open to surrounding counties of which Gunnison County is one. So send them my way. <laughs> RBC is here to help as well. Um, and Sam here has a, a resource for everyone. I'm going to hand my turn. So I actually have two. My name is Samantha Drozier. Um, so first off, the building that you're in, the Commons on Champa, it has free co-working for any entrepreneurs who feel lonely and are struggling with getting stuff done. You have a community here, their tagline, and full disclosure, I don't work for them. I just really enjoy the space. Uh, but their tagline is, if you're starting up, start here. And so they have people uh, with the resources that you need to start your business here at the Common on, uh, Commons on Champa. Another group that I want to plug is the Colorado Startups community. So coloradostartups.org has an ecosystem canvas. It is a curated by the community resource of all of SBGC 
SBA, all of the different programs that you as an entrepreneur have access to, and if you know of one that's not on there, you can get that added into it. Or if you know of one that's no longer in existence, you can let them know, hey, take this one off. It's not valid anymore. But what was the name of that again? ColoradoStartups.org. Um, and so the, if you're concerned that there's not enough resources out there, then you need to be in groups that are building these things and you can come to the Commons on Champa and help with the things that are already happening and building that. So I, uh, I encourage you guys to look at that and if you have any questions, feel free to come see me. That's awesome.